Eric, uh, base labs and uh, talking about the topic of, of the software defined car, I think is probably a good starting point just to understand uh, where we've been in the past, uh, sort of up until maybe 10 years ago, uh, an electronic control unit, more commonly termed simply ECU, had a single function. So we might have a, a windscreen wiper ECU, a headlight e ECU, and each of those ECUs had maybe one or two sensors, something like a, a rain sensor and an ambient light sensor. How is the uh, electrical electronic architecture, also known as EE architecture, changing, and what's driving that change? Yeah, yeah, that's a highly relevant question. So indeed, in the past, we only had those those uh, those ECUs that had a single function. But I would say it's also important to understand that those sensors that you mentioned, like rain sensors, they had let's say very small amount of data only. Uh, so they had an individual signal maybe giving an indication whether it's raining or not or what's the amount of rain that's 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 all and so i think we have uh, two two major things that that drive this change this is on on the one side the the, the huge amount of data that the new sensors are bringing like the cameras imagine high resolution camera images imagine radar sensors that have lots of detections that they are providing and, and lidar sensors of course they also provide lots of lots of data points that that need to be transferred over the wire so that's re a really technical challenge the the, the bandwidth that or the devices the bandwidth question in the car uh, the, the second thing which drives that change is that those new sensors they all perceive the environment of the car uh, and and they they want to uh, understand which other traffic participants are, are out there, and that's really that's really the new thing. And 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 for that we need processing and a lot of processing power, and algorithms, and, and and I would say those two things that that drive that that change and also introduce things like new domain controllers and high performance computing and all these things. Now that, that's an interesting point you make there about this this change to different architectures and and as you said the, the sensors are very varied they're different sizes they have different amounts of of data that they're delivering and they're delivering it at different sampling rates um, but i think one of the other things we're seeing as well is that a single sensor is actually going to be used by more than one ecu and that's that's a change from the way these automotive systems have been built in the past is that right yeah de definitely and um, so although we, we always talk about a, a single sensor like, like a radar, uh, especially if that sensor is used by multiple ECUs, as you said, then typically we also see that those multiple ECUs have different requirements towards the sensor. So it might be that one ECU uh, requires a specific data format from that sensor and a, a specific data level even. And another ECU may, may require a, another data format from the very same sensor or, or even data at a different level. Um, so this makes it really much more complex than in previous architectures, I would say. And so what are the challenges that arise because of that? Because we've, we've got now maybe one sensor at the front of the car, like you said, a radar, but that now needs to provide that data to, to multiple ECUs within the vehicle because they're all using that information for different things. Yeah, I mean, if we talk about these, these ECUs and those requirements, then we always have the question, how much of processing also happens on the sensor side? Right. And uh, this, uh, this also has influences to the bandwidth that is then required. There are driving functions that have, let's say, low requirements uh, to the amount of data that, that such a sensor is providing. So more pre-processing or processing can, can take place on the sensor, uh, but which also increases the processing power that is required on sensor side. We have other driving functions or ECUs that, that, that tell or that want to have the data at a more lower level, for instance, which requires less pre-processing uh, on the sensor side, but more pre-processing on such a, let's say, central processing unit, for instance. And those things, they have to be combined and they have to be present at, at the same at the same system, the same car. So I, I would say that's, that's uh, one, one of the challenges that we definitely see, deciding on which level uh, those sensors provide their data, how much pre-processing uh, occurs on, on which side. Uh, and it's always, that's kind of a wave. It's also kind of going through the industry uh, from, um, with time, kind of. So we see that this also changes. 
and in one in one year, let's say, a lot of pre-processing uh, takes place in the in the sensor on the sensor side. And another year, OEMs and maybe even suppliers want, want to have more processing in the central DCG side. So it's re it's really kind of a wave uh, in the industry. So the, the data from these sensors is, is being brought together and it's a term, the process is, is normally termed fusing, so data fusion. And that sort of brings it into a sort of homogenous form that can be used by the ECU. How, how is that implemented? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, so actually, if we talk about fusing or sensor fusion, which is also a commonly used term there, then I would say it's rather an umbrella term for, for a bunch of algorithms and techniques that are out there that are already existent or present since, since years or even decades, but also algorithms that are currently heavily under, under development. Um, so which, which um, and, and there are different reasons uh, for, for doing or because of, uh, why we are doing sensor fusion. Um, one typical reason is that <clears throat> you, you want to uh, reduce things like sensor noise. So, so think of a radar, for instance, that provides a distance measurement and an angle measurement of, of an object that is in front of the car. Then typically the radar provides highly accurate distance measurements, uh, but it's not, it's not that good in, in observing the, the, the angle or the lateral position of an object. So now you, 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 can, you can add a second sensor with opposite uh, properties like a camera, uh, which is good in, 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 in observing the angle or lateral position, but it's not that good in, in measuring or observing the, the distance of an object. So if you combine those sensors, then in theory, you get best of both worlds. And that's what sensor fusion is doing. That's one, that's one reason why we do this, combining the strengths of two, of two sensors in terms of, of measurement noise and sensor errors. But in another very important aspect or reason why we're doing sensor fusion is that um, you want to, to increase uh, availability. So it might be that one sensor um, detects an object, but the other one does not. Um, and, and, by, and by combining do, uh, those two sensors, you can increase the availability of, of the system. And the last and the third uh, very important reason is with using false alarms. Uh, it's, it's, it's very often not very likely that the sensor reports an object but actually there's, there's no object at all there. But then the other one can, let's say, reduce this, this false alarm rate. That's the third reason. And, and depending which of those things you are addressing in your system, um, the resulting algorithm uh, can differ. But at the end, all of those algorithms, they typically address all of these aspects at, at once with, let's say, different weights of these aspects. Yeah. So where's the sensor fusion actually deployed? Is it, can it be deployed in the sensors or is it typically dis deployed then in the ECU or, or maybe do we have sense, several sensors connected to, to an electrical system to a, like a sub ECU that then uh, fuses the data together and then parses it in a, in a common format to, to uh, a domain controller or an HPC? You know, all of the options are valid <laughs> and all of the options are done at the moment in the industry. So we see um, sensors that do sensor fusion inside the sensor. Uh, for instance, there are camera sensors where you can directly connect a, a radar, an additional radar sensor to, to the camera sensor. And then the camera is kind of the master, uh, also the master processing unit. Uh, also, the, the, the opposite or vice versa is also possible. You have the, the, the radar as the master and get some data from the camera. That's an option. But uh, last time, more and more also OEMs want to do this centrally. So sensors just provide their data at certain levels. And then the sensor fusion is taking place on, on a central processing unit. This is also because um, the, the lower the data level gets, the more processing power you need. Um, and then, um, at least for, for, for modern systems and higher automation systems, you really need much more processing power in terms of a CPU or even GPUs, depending on the, on the system that you have in mind. Yeah, the, obviously, we've seen a lot, a lot of new sensors in the vehicle compared to a decade ago. There's, there's um, short range and long range sensors. You, you've mentioned cameras already as well. And all these are being used for advanced safety systems and even there's a, a looking toward uh, implementing autonomous driving. Uh, those sensors, uh, what sort of information do those sensors deliver? How much, uh, how much is the information already processed by the time it comes into the sensor fusion software block? 
Yeah. Um, all the there we, we see a, a, a wide range of, of options in the industry, and I wouldn't say there is there is a standard yet established. For, for instance, look at the camera sensor. Um, there we have uh, what is typically called smart sensors um, that provide a list of objects. Uh, for instance, where each of those uh, objects in the list consists of um, position, uh, velocity, driving direction, acceleration, length, width, th those properties on an object level. That's a very typical approach that we also see for, for, for the ADAS uh, that we have in the market today. Uh, but staying on, on the camera side, a uh, new, newer system, um, they, they cannot really work with, with that with that level of data also on the object list, they, for instance, require to, 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 to get the images directly with some semantic label attached to each of those uh, pixels. And you can imagine that this, uh, that this increases uh, the amount of data a lot, but also increases the information that it's still in the data. Uh, and the more you go to higher levels of automation, the more data or the more information about the environment you need, and this this drives this this data level uh, going towards lower levels. Um, yeah, it's a similar thing for for radars. In the past, we saw a lot of uh, smart radars. Again, they provided a list of objects, each of those objects with position, driving direction, velocity, and so on. Uh, newer newer systems, they 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 go one level below that, where you get detections. So, which also means that. For a single object, you may get multiple uh, points along uh, the, the car, for instance, on, on the road. Um, and this is then uh, called a high resolution radar, uh, where you get hundreds uh, of, those, of those points. And if you go to LiDAR, then you get thousands or tens of thousands or even hundred thousand uh, of, of points. Of the of the vehicle surrounding uh, per per shot per cycle, uh, which 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 means if you have a, a sensor, a 20 milliseconds uh, update rate, then you get this 50 times a second. So a lot a lot of data is coming and need to be processed. And so when the the data is coming in, how 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 is the the base lab solution presenting that data to uh, the 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 systems that are in the vehicles so that they can make an intelligent decision? Because obviously this this is a safety critical functionality in many cases for um, guiding the vehicle, getting it in lane, or or maybe making a decision as to whether to brake promptly because there's a pending accident about to happen. <laughs> Yeah, that definitely. Again, this, this depends on the driving function, and there are different levels for that output as well. Um, so if you if you look at uh, today's ADAS functionalities, then typically customers request us to provide lists of objects again. Um, so then in the simplest case, um, lots of lists go in to such an algorithm from Baselabs, and again, a list of objects gets out but with better properties, higher accuracy, less false alarm, and maybe an even higher detection rate or availability. So all the things that come with, with sensor fusion, um, they, they also come at that, at that level. There are other customers and then driving functions that uh, need the output of such a sensor fusion at, at a lower level. Uh, for, for instance, uh, there we, we provide an output on what we call a cell level. Right, where you have the world discretized in, in a bunch of cells, um, tens or hundreds of thousands of, of such cells, and where each cell represents whether uh, this uh, uh, region uh, is occupied by an object or not. And if it's occupied by an object, uh, what's the speed or the velocity of that object? Um, and what's the driving direction um, once again? But it's at, at a lower level uh, where the base of software, for instance, didn't didn't decide uh, which of those cells build an object or not. Uh, this then comes at at a later stage um, on the customer side. And there are driving functions that, that never require that, that an object representation has has been built. They always operate on such on such lower levels. Um, the, obviously, a, a big part of the move towards software-defined vehicles is that, um, now we're making software responsible for our safety. And um, I mean, that's, that's something that the aerospace industry has been been tackling for decades already. But obviously, there's a, a, a significantly smaller number of aircraft uh, flying around in comparison to the number of vehicles on the road under completely different conditions. So how does a, a company like Base Labs ensure 
the quality of, of software, which is essentially a framework. You, you don't know as you've, you're developing this framework how it's going to be used and, and necessarily which sensors are going to be attached in every possible use case. And, and therefore to ensure the safety of the software that's being uh, put into these systems. Yeah, uh, that's a highly relevant question. Um, so uh, at, at the end, for at least some of the aspects, we, we, we do it very similarly to, to, uh, to the other industry that, that are in the market since, since decades. Um, so following standards uh, developing or well, in processing processes or standards calling or that, that relate to the processes, how you develop the software. In automotive industry, uh, the, the most common standard is the ISO 26262 uh, for functional safety. Um, that's something that we follow our software is also certified uh, according to that standard um, up to a safety level or rating of ACL B. Uh, so you probably know there are, there are four of these ratings from A to D and B is, is the one we, we got certified for our software. So we follow this, those standards. Also things like um, ASPICE development processes, which are well-established um, processes. And then of course, we are, we are doing tests uh, a lot. And I mean, this it, is a topic by itself. And, and of yeah. course we are doing the, the things um, that have to be done testing with simulated data, so artificial data, uh, but also testing uh, with, with customer data. So in, in, in fact, uh, most of the data that, that we have and that we use for testing is, is coming from, from our customers, uh, from real vehicles with real sensor setups, because at the end, the edge cases, uh, um, that's, uh, that they are, they are hard to find using, using simulated data only. And at exactly. the end, you need the, the, the data from the real scenarios from the real world. Um, and our approach is um, um, taking the data from the from the customers, uh, putting them into the software, and then testing whether it's doing the right things. Super. Well, thanks very much for providing that insight into uh, sensor fusion and also the the, yeah, the new range of sensors and, and how they're being integrated in, into the automotive mix. Um, we'll come back and uh, get you to provide some comments and, and thoughts and uh, some other questions as well when we do the roundtable session at the end. Thanks very much. Sure. You're welcome. Super.